<laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. No, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and welcome to the White House. It's great to see so many old friends and supporters. And I have to make a special mention of Jim Roberts and Dan Lundgren. As the president and honorary chairman of Radio America, you've allowed me to keep a hand in my old profession. <laughs> and, uh, my real true love, radio announcing. I was even broadcasting a game one day when it wasn't a game going on. <laughs> I really was. <laughs> I set a record for a man standing up, up at the plate and hitting successive foul balls. It was the ninth inning of a game between the Cubs and the Cards. It was tied up. Jurgis was at bat. And I was doing a telegraphic report. And all of a sudden, I saw the fellow on the other side of the window type, so I thought there was a play coming, and he handed me the slip of paper, said, the wire's gone dead. <laughs> I thought, ninth inning? I can't, I can't just tell him we'll play some music or something. <laughs> so I thought, well, what doesn't get in the scorecard? So I had Jurgis foul one off. And then I had him foul another one off. And then he fouled one that was just missed being a home run by a foot. <laughs> then I described the two kids that, that, were, that caught, got in a fight over the ball that went back of third base. And, and I was just about beginning to run out of gas and thinking, this can't go on, and now they'll know I've been snowing them when he sat up and started typing again. And I started another ball on the way to the plate, and he handed me the slip, and then I started to giggle. Jurgis popped out on the first ball pitched. <laughs> Well, well, anyway, I thank them, and Tom Winter and Alan Riskin, and, well, how can I thank any of you enough? In the pages of human events, one gets a picture of the world as it really is. And, of course, you know I'm a faithful reader because I'm always quoting that paper. At the risk of offending the secular humanists, I might even say, I read your paper religiously. <laughs> All of you at Radio America and Human Events represent what I would call a truly independent press. You give a fresh perspective, a vital alternative to monolithic media interpretations. And the need for a fresh perspective reminds me of a story. It's about two Muscovites who were walking down the street in Moscow, and one of them said to the other, so how are things going? And the other realized, oh, wonderful, wonderful. Things couldn't be better. Wonderful, the first one exclaimed. Have you read Pravda today? Well, he said, of course I have. How else would I know that things are wonderful? <laughs> well, I'm, as usual, they've overscheduled me, and uh, I don't want to talk too long, but I know also that there's not going to be any possibility of greeting each one of you individually. I know that the theme of your leadership conference is the bicentennial of our Constitution, and I thought I might give you a sort of sneak preview of what I'm going to be saying tomorrow at the Jefferson Memorial. Later in life, when Jefferson examined our Constitution, he found only one major flaw, really an omission, and it wasn't in the area of political liberties, the freedoms of speech and worship and assembly and all. Those he could be confident he'd secured for all posterity with the Bill of Rights. In Jefferson's eyes, the glaring omission was not in the political, but in the economic realm a failure to include an article in the Constitution that would prohibit government borrowing, what we've come to call deficit financing. His concern ran deeper than his well-founded fears of profligate government. From history and experience, he knew that it was in the economic realm that the oppression of government was often most keenly felt. 
He knew that a government with no limit on borrowing was a government with no limit on its power over the individual. That this power to borrow was like a wedge that could, and we know would, be driven between the individual and his God-given rights of freedom and property. When I signed the tax reform bill, I said that these last decades had seen an expansion and strengthening of our civil liberties, but that our economic rights have been too often neglected and even abused. Well, it's time that abuse stopped, and that's why tomorrow I've chosen to stand at the foot of the Jefferson Memorial and call for an economic bill of rights that will complement and strengthen Jefferson's political bill of rights. So in the coming months, we'll be needing the voice of independent journalism all the more. We'll be needing the support of all of you as we make our case for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the Jefferson ideal, the American ideal of limited government and a free, proud, and independent people. And I will be suggesting tomorrow specifics of legislation that the Congress needs to find out the people of this country want. Now, as I said, I know that I'm very short on time here, and I know that there wouldn't be any chance of meeting each one of you independently, and I just happen to think myself, since you're the only press in the room, uh, <laughs> maybe we could have just a little dialogue. I know I haven't much time left here, but a few minutes of dialogue that some of you might have said to yourself at one time or the other, boy, if I had a chance, I'd like to ask him. <laughs> And uh, now's your chance. We could have a little dialogue. What are you going to say about Madison? Well, actually, I'm sticking pretty much with Jefferson and, the, and then getting right into our economic program. Uh, <laughs> 9.45, I'm due there. So I, and I guess I go right on. Thank you for nominating Judge Ford. Well... It would seem from what I heard up on the hill yesterday after I made that announcement <laughs> uh, that there are a few people who think the primary qualification for a Supreme Court justice is adherence to the democratic dogma. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't think that's so yet. Uh, I've never put it away. <laughs> no, it, I, uh, thanks to C-SPAN, I now and then when I get home a little early, I can see some of what's going on up on the hill. <laughs> and uh, there are some things that there's only one answer to them. That's veto. <laughs> oh, wait one second. The commercialization of space, well, this we're very interested in. We talked to NASA about this, and we've had conversations about that. The SDI thing is a completely different operation, and I believe is the one answer to the ultimate total elimination of nuclear weapons in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, we, we should commercialize, just as we should privatize a lot of things that the government's doing today, like Amtrak. This is, this is sheer coincidence. We, we had a full cabinet meeting this morning, and the whole meeting was on the subject of how in this next year and a half that's left, 
do we pin down and make permanent the things that we've accomplished so that they will be continue into the future? That's what we're are what are we going to devote ourselves to doing. Well, spread the word, first of all, and then again, and the word to the people that Congress, and I think we'll, <laughs> he will, he will agree with this, that Congress do respond when they hear from the folks back home. The trouble is, in so much of the press today, there is such a drumbeat the other way. For example, I just, I can't believe it when I hear some of our opponents up on the hill stand right up there and on television and so forth say why I'm I'm the cause of the deficit and they say he he hasn't submitted a balanced budget since he's been here well of course not there's no one that ever thought with the deficit the size it is that in one year you could balance the budget without doing a great deal of harm pulling the rug out from under a number of people but Graham Rudman Hollings met what was my goal and what my plan was, and that was to set a target down here where year by year you could reduce it down and you could point to that date and say there we will have reached a balanced budget, ending the deficit. And in the meantime, that we pass a balanced budget amendment set at such a date so that never again can we get ourselves in this situation. But you, you have got to be the voices to counter this drumbeat of propaganda. And it's on every facet. The whole thing about I pick up the polls and see how the people think it's, it's all right to whittle away at the defense spending. We wouldn't have the Soviet Union sitting at a table with us talking about arms reduction if we hadn't rebuilt our military. But they've heard that drumbeat about $400 hammers and $640 toilet seats and so forth. They failed to see we're the ones that discovered those things. That's what had been going on, and we've, we've corrected it. It ain't going on anymore. I know you were trying to point out what openness really means. Not a trickle, but the freedom of America. Well, yes, and let me say that uh, I'm not going down that road that has been traveled too often where just to get an agreement we'll sign anything. Uh, 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 as a matter of fact, in my last meeting with him, I managed to learn a little Russian. <laughs> and uh, I launched it at him. Dovayai no provayai. It's a Russian proverb. It means trust, but verify. <laughs> he smiled. <laughs> but, what? I am afraid to talk about it because sometimes if you, if you act that way, then they figure that they've got you over a barrel or something. But he has the invitation. It's, was He had promised that it would be in this country, and uh, we're still having our fingers crossed, but I'm afraid to predict uh, <laughs> for fear they may Mr. change President, their minds. Yes, Father. Mr. President, will you be making a new fresh move to bring peace to the Middle East and bring our hostages back? We haven't given up on that uh, ever since we've, we've been here. We've had setbacks in it, but still the difficulty is that outside of Egypt, and now King Hussein and Jordan, who are trying very sincerely to bring this about, we still have not gotten the, the uh, other Arab states uh, to agree to come along. And now we're all looking at this subject of possibly an international meeting to try and bring uh, the forces together. But uh, that has to be a goal because we know that that's where the final one can finally take place. If, uh, Mr. President, I do realize I am an Armenian spiritual leader, 
And I want to convince our new generation to totally commit themselves to the democratic institutions of this country. Oh. Will you be, will you help us, Mr. President? Yes, and as a, with our yes, and as a matter of fact, there is one thing that I, that we are doing and that has not stopped and we're increasing, and that is the exchange of youth. I have a feeling that if the kids of the world, the young people, could all get to know each other, there never would be another war. And so uh, we've got a whole big detachment of the finest looking young people from our high schools that are on their way over there, going to be in five European countries, and including behind the Iron Curtain. We're having some of them here, and we're going to keep up as much of that as, as we can. Thank you. Yes. Well, I am in favor of a free press, but I also want a responsible press. And uh, I think that too often uh, we, we're not seeing that. For example, when I read a story about a Catholic bishop in this country down in um, uh, Nicaragua, and that he managed to get over a thousand refugees across the border into Honduras that were fleeing Nicaragua, but that on the way they were attacked by the Contras, and yet he managed to get them free. And then the story wound up saying that he was back in America at his post here. And I couldn't resist. I called him and told him what I had read and asked him about it. And he said, well, the story uh, about me getting the thousand refugees across the Honduran border is true, but we were attacked by the Sandinistas. We were rescued by the Contras. I've never seen that story corrected. I went over to the State Department one day and over 750 of the Washington press were in that room with all the TV cameras grinding. And they were there for three people from Nicaragua, two former Sandinistas who had walked away from it, and a third a minister, a clergyman, black minister from a church down there, and they all three spoke and told all of these people their experiences and why they were taking the course they were taking. The minister didn't have any ears left. They had arrested him just for preaching and then in jail had cut both his ears off, among other things. And then that night I watched on the news because my only words were just a few words about thanking them and so forth for being there. That's all I saw on the news was me saying a few words and not one word about these three people. And they weren't on any talk shows and they weren't interviewed or anything of that kind. And uh, I just, I think it, yes, everybody's entitled to their opinion. They also should know what they're talking about. Oh, yes, 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 the Sandinistas, I know I'm running out of time, I'll get right there. The Sandinistas have one of the most effective disinformation networks I've ever seen, including a slick paper magazine published in Berkeley, California, that is a Sandinista propaganda piece. And uh, the thing that they can do with groups that go down there well-intentioned, like a recent church group, and then came back totally on the Sandinista side. Well, they'd been given the planned tour. They hadn't been able to get out and see what's really going on. It's the places of Potemkin village. And, and um, so, no, the, the Contras, there's no way that we can bring about a change unless we stay with them. Keep going there, and then I'll come here. Well, you left out another one. We're very definitely, we're very definitely helping the people in Afghanistan, and uh, the, to a sizable extent. And in Mozambique, 
There I can only tell you that we have a belief and have reason to believe, very good reason, we and our allies, that that government is seeking to turn and to have uh, a contact with the West. And so uh, this is what we're playing on. We've had the previous president who was killed, and then we've had this second president here in Washington. And uh, as I say, I think that they are trying to loosen the ties they once had in the other direction and tie themselves to us. And so don't ask me too many questions about what we're doing about that. <laughs> Mr. President, I've been to the Century Plaza Hotel many times, fellow Californians. You cannot leave here until you shake this young lady's and wheelchair hand today. You must do it. I will, because I'm going to have to go right out there. And just, <laughs> and, uh, I, I am going to have to go out that way. But uh, thank you all very much. I'm going to take one more second, just one second to tell you one more experience I had with Mr. Gorbachev. I am collecting stories that I can establish are absolutely told by the Russian people among themselves about their country. And it shows they've got a sense of humor and also they're a little cynical about things. And I couldn't resist telling one of them to Gorbachev because I was getting acquainted with him there. And this was a story that they tell. It's about a Russian and American, and they're having an argument about freedom. And the American said, look, I can walk into the Oval Office, and I can pound the president's desk, and I can say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running our country. And the Russian said, well, I can do that. And the American said, you can? He said, yes, I can walk into the Kremlin, pound on the general secretary's desk, and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way President Reagan's running his country. <laughs>